This one is done differently. Um, we're having issues, technical issues with with uh, YouTube, so we have to do this one differently. It's okay. Um, if you will, open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 29. This is a message that I believe has not been talked about a lot. There needs to be more of this message. Um, we need to hear more of how important this is. So Proverbs chapter 29. We're going to start at verse 22. An angry man stirreth up strife, and furious man aboundeth in transgression. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold, be humble in spirit. Whoso is partner with the thief hateth his own soul, he heareth cursing, beware of it not. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Many seek in the ruler's favor, but every man's judgment cometh from the Lord. An unjust man is an abomination to the just, and he that is upright in the way is abomination to the wicked. Let's pray. Father of us who are in the heavens, Hallowed be the name of you, our Lord. We ask for your wisdom, your revelation today as we read your words, as we understand them, and they help guide us. We ask for strength in this world that we may be able, that we may be able to do the things that you want us to do in your way. That we truly listen to the words today so we can humble ourselves and sit at your feet as our Lord, our Redeemer, our Christ, and our Savior. And we say this in the name of you, Yeshua. Amen. So with this, man's pride, all right, our pride alone is pretty devastating. It's not a good thing. But if you see here on verse 23, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Humble. See, if pride is going to drop you down, the humble will raise you. God will raise you in your humbleness. Let's go right now to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Now here, Christ is, is giving us guidance, right? This is the Sermon on the Mount that we are um, in the middle of. And he's, he's teaching you on prayer. And he tells the disciples, or tells everyone there, let's listen to this. On uh, chapter 6, verse 5. And when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, and they that may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou prayest, enter in thy closet, 
And when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So here we see he's starting you off with a negative. It says, when thou pray, don't be this way. Right? Don't do with this. It's a negative. But then he follows it up with says, when thou prayest, enter in thy closet. So this is the way, this is the positive way to pray. Right? So go back, I'd stay within this within this way, or within this verse. I'm sorry, uh, chapter. And we're going to go down to uh, verse 16. And here he's teaching everyone on fasting. He says, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of sad countenance, for they are disfigured their faces, they that may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. So just as he was teaching them to pray with the negative, started off with the negative and then ended with the positive, right? And notice here that Christ isn't saying when, or I'm not saying if you pray. He's given us a command. He says, when thou pray. So as believers in Christ, as we walk with them, it's kind of mandatory for us to pray. This is not subjective. This is what we are called to do. It's what we do, right? So he's not saying, if you pray, pray it this way. No, he's saying, when you pray. He's not saying, if you fast. He's saying, when you fast. This is, this is something that we have gotten away from, where we don't fast. And the importance of fasting is very important. So what is fasting? Real quick. Sorry. He was <laughs> he was saying something at the beginning. What is fasting? Fasting is abstaining from eating for spiritual gain. You choose not to eat. And we're going to get in this uh, further. So fasting is Not eating, right? It's, a, it's, it's, it's preventing yourself from eating. But what's the purpose for that? Why would you want to do that? Why would you hold your, your wants and desires to eating? Why would you hold that back? Is it to burden yourself? Is it to make life hard? You know? No. It is a... An, it's, it's God's appointed way to humble yourself. Right? Pride gets in our way. Pride will put up barriers in your life. Right? You know, pride. So when you look at this, as, as far as when we go to eat, when we go to we we are full of of gusto, full of arrogance, full of all that. Right? I'm hungry. I want to eat whenever I want. But it's the abstain it's the stopping of that. It's the I want to eat, but I'm not going to eat. Right? I want to live for God in his control, live for him what he does and how he wants me to live. So I'm not gonna follow my prideful ways in my own body, my own flesh. So I'm gonna abstain from what I want to do. And I'm going to listen to what God wants to do. Right? Pride's dangerous. Pride is dangerous. It gets us into a lot of bad situations. Right? And it keeps us, mostly, it keeps us from God's blessings. Pride is evil. Pride is wicked. But when you're full of pride, when you're full of it, it's going to stop. You're going to... Pull away from that. Send me up. Stop. It's okay. Stop. So, let's go now. There's there's three passages that deal with pride and humility. All right. 
Let's go to uh, Luke, chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, verse 11 says, For whoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humble himself shall be exalted. What verse? Uh, <coughs> chapter 14, verse 11. And this particular one, Christ is teaching us that look, if we go to any type of of gathering that is not of your own. When you go and you sit, and this particular one is talking about a wedding, when you sit down, you don't sit in the highest room, meaning you don't sit where the king seat is, where the MC is sitting, where whomever's throwing the party or whoever the party is about, you don't sit in their chair. You sit in the lowest chair. Right? You sit in the lowest chair. <coughs> You don't do that. You allow them, it's their where their ways you sit with. You let them have their moment. And then a friend will call upon you and will raise you, will bring you to the front if they want. So Christ is saying here, so whoever exalts themselves, whoever puts themselves in the front seat, whoever puts themselves in that in that area, it's gonna be very embarrassing for them. You go, hey, uh, sorry, but you're not supposed to sit there. You're supposed to, that's where the, the head of the party is, where the king's sitting, right? That's where the birthday boy's sitting. You come down here. It's very embarrassing for that to happen. But also think about it this way. If we humble ourselves, there's only one way to go. If you sit in the lowest seat, there's only one way to go. So only go up. So you sit in the low. And you allow the, the leader of the pack, you allow the, the MC, the one that's hosting the, the party, you allow them to bring you up front. See, same thing with Christ. You humble yourself. You put yourself at his feet. You are not equal. <clears throat> you put yourself at his feet and humble yourself and allow Christ to go look at me and go, child, come here, let me raise you. Let's go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 10. Here it says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Again, humble yourselves. Humility is, is a very, it goes against our nature as humans, right? We don't want to be humbled. We want to be proud. That's why Christ tells us that, that to boast, you should not boast. In Romans, he gives you a whole bunch of lists that in Romans chapter 1, a list of things, and boasting is something you don't do. You're not very humble, right? Being prideful and boasting of what you're capable of doing doesn't, it can put a bad taste in other people's mouth about you. Oh, here's this person. Oh, Mr. Do-It-All. He's always good. He's always this, right? And then you get this, this idea in your head that I can do it. I'm the best at what it is. That's why saying you're the best at what you do is not necessarily a humble way of living it. If you want to be the best, just do it. Do it. Show people what you are. 
but don't boast about it. Be humble. Like I'm just, in reality, God has given you the gift to do the things that you want to do. Right? God has given you that ability. It is not yours, it's God's. So by you boasting and being prideful of it, you're taking ownership of it when the glory is still His. Humble yourselves. Sit at the feet of the Lord and allow Him to raise you up. Now let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5 real quick. First Peter, chapter five, verse, verse six. It's towards the end. First Peter, uh, Peter chapter five, verse six. Again, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. There's a theme here you're seeing, right? Humbling yourself, putting yourself at the foot of people, putting yourself at the foot of, of the world. And what does God do? God will raise you up. See, none of us like to be on the bottom. We don't like it. It's something about it, right? We write, we, we in school, we want to be the best. In school, in sports, we want to be the best in sports. Nobody wants to be the worst. So we have this thing in ourselves to say, I have to push to be the best in what we do. I want to be the best baseball player. I want to be the smartest in class. I want to be the best artist, right? And so as good as that is to get through school and, and learn the sport, right? When you give God the praise and the glory for what you are able to do and your ability, you still sit, sit at God's feet. You still humble yourself. You don't act prideful and boast while you're with your teammates or with whomever, right? You give everything that you have to God and you say, thank you, Father. Thank you for granting me the ability to do the things that I do that many children in this world or people in this world can't do. You don't walk around arrogant thinking I am the best and everyone look at me. Humble yourselves. Because if you're the best and if you have that idea in your head and you walk with that, why do you need God in your life? You're the best already. Why do you need him? You know, he came here to save and to help the ones that are in need. And though you have a talent, you still give his glory, give all of it to him. Let him raise you up, he will exalt you. Would you put yourself low in this world and he's gonna exalt you in the heavenly. So how do you humble yourself? Right? How do you humble yourself within the Bible context? Not humans. What does God say about humbling? The answer is in fasting. Let's go to Psalm 35. Psalm 35 here, David. David talks about it. This humbled my soul with fasting 
and my prayer returned returned into my own bosom. Um, sorry, Psalm. Um, Psalm thirty-five, thirteen, verse thirteen. Psalm 35, verse 13. It says, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into my own bosom. See, David humbles his soul how? By fasting. Right? Why would you want to, why is David pulling out humbling my soul? Why your soul? Well, the soul is the arrogant part of you, right? It's the arrogance. It's egotistical. There's basically three parts to your soul that work this way. You have your will, you have your intellect, and you have your emotions, right? In and the soul expresses itself in, in three different ways or, or within these three ways. It says, within your will, I want. And it says, within your intellect, I think. And within your emotions, I feel. There's a lot of eyes there. Well, God says, I don't care about what you feel. I don't care about what you think. Right? I don't care about what you want. Why? Because it's all about God. It's about what He wants. It's living within His world. We are walking with Him, for Him, because of Him. So we are doing God's will. We are changing the way our carnal mind thinks and we are trying to do what he thinks, what he wants us to think. And if we go by our feelings, well, we're all corrupt. So we have to do what God feels, what he teaches us how to feel. He gives us a new heart so we can feel within the God's ways. I, so, you know, I just did this fasting myself. And along that, you, you kind of have to fight really, really hard to do this in the sense of you see the food, you see the wants, you see the desires, you know what they taste like, right? And people are eating in front of you and yet you, you abstain from eating, you stop it. You know, I'm surrounded by my family and everyone's eating. It's tough. It is tough. But you learn, you, you so learn when you're lying in bed and you just pray and you just talk and you say thank you because without his strength, you probably don't, I don't know if I could have done it. I'm so used to eating and that's the problem is that we are so used to eating. We have this, this arrogance about it that we can walk into our fridge any given time and open it up and eat food. And we take snacks with us, so when we're hungry on the road, we can open up a snack box and eat it. That's the arrogant in, in part of us. But David tells us to humble thy soul. How? By fasting. God tells us to humble us. Humble yourselves and I will lift you up. Abstain from your own wants and your own desires with other, other things out there, yes, definitely in the realm of being an adult, but to understand the importance of fasting to give everything to him, you're hungry, you want, you have this, this desire. Now, now, how bad we want to eat. When Satan tested Christ, what was the first thing he asked him to do? The first thing he did, first temptation, was turn these stones to bread. Because the desire to eat, we're so hungry. That's how important it is. So God's telling us, stop. It's okay. 
Stop fulfilling your stomach full of the things of this world, full of your gluttony, full of your wants and desires. And listen to me. The stomach is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. So who is your master? Is it you? Is it God? Is it your stomach? So there's a couple of examples that um, we're going to go to. Let's go to um, Leviticus in the Old Testament. Leviticus 16. Verse 29 through 31. So this is the atonement, right? This is God's giving them a whole bunch of, of rules. Chapter, Chapter uh, 16, verse 29 and 31 in Leviticus. God's given, there's a, it's a whole bunch of rules, right? To atone for their sins. You have to do all this, do all this, and do all this, Right? And in order to do all that, God is also re requiring you one thing. All right? 16. Chapter 16, verse 29 through 31. So in the in the rules, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29 through 31. Right? Then the rules of, of uh, the atonement, like to benefit from the atonement, you have to humble yourself. Just like you have to humble yourself to benefit from Christ and what he did on the cross. So in here it says, And this shall be the statue forever unto you, that in the serving month, for the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls, and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own, a countryman or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, that ye shall afflict your souls by a statue forever. So the word afflict here is humble. Humble your souls. Right? So it says, For on that day, the priest shall make an atonement for you, to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Well, who cleansed our sins? Christ. See, what he did on the cross allows us to humble. We, we go to him. We say, thank you. We help you. The work was done. The work that he did on the cross was done. But in order for us to benefit from that work that took place on the cross within Christ, we now have to humble ourselves to come to him. Just because he did it doesn't mean that we are saved. It's because he did it that we humble ourselves to him that allows us to be saved. That we recognize who he is and what he did for us. Because there's many people out there in the world that believe, yeah, he did it, means nothing. But then there's ones that believe he did it, and we draw and we fall at his feet. And we say, thank you, we love you, we worship you. And we allow him to pick us up. I like what, what um, I always refer to the, the image in my head when I say he picks us up when Peter was in the water and Christ reached down and grabbed his hand. We'll forever be drowning in our world, our waters of sorrows, of sins. It's a treacherous tread of water. If we haven't been in the ocean or water in general, we're constantly just trying to stay afloat, stay afloat. Gotta move, gotta do this, gotta do that. You get tired, but we rest, we humble ourselves give ourselves to God and allow God to pull us out of that water. We're already going down. 
We're already dead, but it's only him that's gonna save us. Let's go to Ezra, chapter eight. Ezra in the Old Testament. No. Uh, All right, Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. So, here, they're returning the exiles in this one. They're coming back from Jerusalem, back to Jerusalem from Babylon. It's a four-month journey, right? But the question was, how are they going to get there safely? Right? How are they going to get to this to Jerusalem back safely from Babylon? It says then I proclaim a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek Him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require the king and a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon them, all of them, for good to seek him. But his power and his wrath is against them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated us. So here, he could have went to the king and asked him, and says, Hey, I'm, I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need some soldiers. I'm going to need some people to help us get through this journey. But he already proclaimed that God can take care of his people, that God will. So if he goes to his, his, the king and asks, he's not, he's not believing what he's saying, right? If he already says, like, look it, God will help us. We are not worried. We have full faith in God. And then turns around and says, hey, I'm sorry. We're going to need your help. You know, it's very easy for the person to go, well, where's your God? Where's the God that you said is going to help you? Now you're coming to me for help? But he knew in his heart that he had to pray. And in it, within his prayer, he was fasting. And within his fasting, he humbled himself. And God saw that. And because of the prayer, and because of the fasting, because of the love of God and the humbling, God answered his prayer. And they got through it. Right? So when you pray, that's how important fasting is. It's prayer and fasting. It's not just prayer. It's not prayer and gluttony. It's not prayer and I can feed my, my belly until I'm, you know, throwing up. It's prayer and fasting. I'm giving you everything. We have to present our bodies to God. Remember that? Present your bodies. How do you present your body if you're constantly fulfilling it with your own wants and your own desires? It's your own. You, you're taking ownership. But for us, it's not. For the believer, it's not. We give ourselves to Him. We give our body to Him. Let's go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings. Uh, chapter 21.
Now this is King Ahab. King Ahab is probably one of the most wicked kings ever. He's the one that married Jezebel. Verse. First Kings chapter 21. Verse. We're going to go to, well, we're going to do uh, first 22, but I want you to understand this is, this is King, again, King Ahab, married Jezebel, wicked, wicked king. Absolute wicked king, full of evil. And because King Ahab is leading his people and they're full of idolatry and full of just evil in, in general, God puts judgment on Ahab. In verse 22, he says, right? Well, verse 21, we'll start there. It says, Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and I will take away thy posterity, and I will cut them off, I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. I will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam and the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha and the son of Eha, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. So he's basically telling me, I'm going to kill all your people. You are sinning against me. You're causing all these people to sin. Judgment will be upon you, and I will wipe you out. Right? What does it tell us here? Fast forward to verse 27. It came to pass when Ahab heard these words that he tend his clothes and put his sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. So you see how Ahab humbled himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days but in his son's days, I will bring evil upon the house. God saw, this is, the, this is Ahab, evil, full of evil. And God saw how he humbled himself. And because he humbled himself, God saw the favor in him. And says, I won't put the judgment upon you. But now the judgment's gonna go upon you. Okay, the judgment's still gonna come. But you humble yourself in the face of the Lord, and the Lord will see it. The Lord will act accordingly in his will. But in order to humble himself, he fasted. Because you give everything to the fast. You get that, that yearning, that desire, the wants, the feeling in your body, and you start to go, and you want to eat. But when you lay there praying, thinking, wishing, hoping, full of love and of the joy in God. When you lay at his feet, God sees that as favor. I mean, even Jonah, remember Jonah? Remember Jonah went to Nineveh, wicked, wicked city, right? He went to Nineveh and to pray. And the first thing that uh, when they heard Jonah's sermon once, the word of the Lord came through Jonah, they heard it one time. And the leader of, of Nineveh says, all right, no one's eating. Not even the, the stock is eating. Not even the animals. Right? After the word they heard from Jonah, they didn't eat. They fasted. And then they changed. That's how important the fast is. So let's go to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter six. Verse. Chapter six, verse four and five. No, sorry. Second Corinthians. I'm reading this going, that doesn't seem right. Oh yeah. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse four and five. So this is Paul's telling us here that 
in his way in ministry, the things he does in his ways in the ministry, proven himself to be a minister to God. He says, but all things are proven ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. So there's all the things that he puts himself through that we will have to do, whether it be in prison, going to jail for God, right, in your trials and tribulations, right, being beaten for God, fasting for God. Then you go to move forward and go to chapter uh, 11 within the same book. Chapter 11, verse 23. It says, are they ministers of Christ? He talks about it. Are they the ones they say they are? Because in weariness, you go to 27, in weariness and in pain. Again, he, he lists a, a list very similar to the one that he, he did in, in uh, chapter 6. But in uh, 27, verse 27, it says, in weariness and, in, and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. So he's saying in, in hunger and thirst, and then he says in fastings. What's the difference between the two? Well, the one, hunger and thirst, is where you don't have food to eat. You don't have it. The fasting is where you have it, and you choose not to eat. So he's telling us that I've done both, that we will do both. But fasting is so important that it's listed in there. You can't count hunger and not having food, not having water. You can't count that as fasting. Fasting is the ability to eat, but stop him from eating because you're giving God his glory. You're coming to him in prayer. You're coming to him in fasting. Let's go to Acts 13 real quick. Acts chapter 13. Now this is where the disciples of Christ you know, they're looking for other people, other, other apostles. Um, we'll start at just one, verse 31. Acts chapter 13. <coughs> It says, now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, Lucius and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetris and Saul. Saul later becomes Paul. So there's five men that are sitting here trying to figure out what's going on, like bringing people in to the, to the church. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they go to God and they fast to find out who to choose. Who do we choose here? Right? So they're going to God with fasting and they're praying. They're going to him, who do we choose? And then once God answers that call, they fast again to find out what to do. And lay their hands on them, or they fast again to send them away. So once they found out who they were going to choose through God's ways by fasting, they fast again to send them off with prayer. Prayer and fasting. They go together. They're one and the same. That's how important it is. And we've forgotten that. We only go to prayer. And oftentimes we go to prayer and then right afterwards we go eat. We always pray when we eat. But how often do we pray and fast? It's a something that they used to always do back in the day. The Hebrews who always fasted. We have gotten rid of that.
But there is hope for us still. There's hope for God's people. Let's go to 2 Chronicles in the Old Testament. Second Chronicles chapter seven. Verse fourteen. It says if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. God asks us to do four things. Four things. Humble yourselves. And we know humbling, fasting, and pray. So while you're fasting, you pray to God. And when you pray to God, you're seeking his face. You're looking towards him. You're looking to him. And when you're looking towards him and you to him, you turn from your wicked ways. You repent. You change your mind. So humble yourselves, you pray, you seek him in your prayer, and you turn from the things that you've done in the past to do only the righteous with the living God. We need to get it back to fasting and prayer. It's important for us to walk with him. It's important for us to humble ourselves in our walk. It's important for us to not boast about who we think we know. Or sometimes it's like, yeah, I know God, I know Christ. And you walk proudly within it. But within the pride is the arrogance. When David met Goliath for the first time, he didn't say, I know God. He says, who is this that's defiling my God? He still was at the foot of God's feet in that battle. He didn't pick up stones and say, everyone, hey, look at me. I will take this guy down. He just picked up stones and walked to Goliath and defeated him. There was humble, humble, humbleness within David's approach to Goliath. And yes, you can still be full of strength within the Lord and have him fill you with strength, but there always needs to be that humbleness. You are back behind him and he's in front of you. And although you may walk in this world and you feel like he's not there, he's there. But if you put yourself in front of the humbleness, you put yourself in front of him, that's gonna mark for hard times in this world. Do you have any questions? Go ahead. How long are you supposed to fast for? There's not a, a definite time um, of fasting. Some I've done three days. Some have done 10, you know, uh, but there is not a particular time in fasting. How do you know what you, how long you are supposed to be um, Some fast just for a day, uh, <coughs> from a certain time at, at night to the next day in the morning. You know, we have, we have taken this intermediate fasting terminology. It's called intermediate fasting, intermediate fasting. And it's just eating one time a day and then going throughout. 
sleeping, like just once a day, the next day eat again. Um, it's funny, again, it's, it's God telling us that I've already told you what to do. I've already told you about the fasting. But we've taken a science approach to it and saying, oh, look at the benefits to fasting, right? If you, science tells us that when you fast, certain things happen within your body, right? That are benefit to your body. God's already been telling us to fast. We have just not, right? It's just one thing that science says, hey, we know more. Um, I guess the addition to the question is, how long do you fast is, does fasting also include drink? There are um, times, yes, where people have gone three days within the biblical aspect, three days without eating and drinking, right? Um, there are times where it's just eating. So it's up to you if you want to eat and drink or uh, just not eat. You know, when I did it, um, when I was fasting, I, I drank, but I did not eat. Um, the purpose behind it is giving yourself and your body to Him. Because when you get that hunger and that desire, you're going to want to go after it. You're going to want to fulfill the fleshly desire. And God says, no, don't fulfill it. Look to me for your hunger. I am the bread of life, Christ says. On the same note, does your body need nutrients? Your, for your body does need nutrients. However, <laughs> a, you're not abstaining from the nutrients for a specific amount of time where it's going to be a detriment to your body. The fasting is not fasting for months. It's fasting for, for days, right? Or a day. Your body will be fine. Unless you get headaches. Well, if you get headaches, then... Look to the Lord. That's where the trouble lies, right? That's what we know for us. If we, we look to our, our bodies telling us, I need this, and God's saying, look to me for your needs, right? You're going to go, there's going to be, it's going to be tough. Absolutely. But there's times in the Bible that they were going to go through some hard times. And in order to get, get through it, they fasted and prayed. Go ahead. I feel like I don't really understand fast, fasting since I don't get it when you say praying and fasting. Well, when you pray, you look to the Lord. And when you're fasting, your body's telling yourself, I want, I want, I want. Right? How many times have you sat there and, and so the question real quick was, we don't necessarily understand the praying and fasting. Like how are they a correlation, right? Well, when you pray, you're looking to the God, but there's times you go, I'm hungry, and you get angry, and you get ornery, right? Like I want, I want, I want. And you're in a bad mood, right? There's this term called hangry. So you start disliking everything around you. Nobody around you can be funny. You don't even care about anybody else. All you want is food, 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 because I'm hungry. I need to satisfy this hunger. And that's the exact opposite of what God wants. See, you're being rude to people because of you and your hunger. And God's saying, no, be nice to people. Humble yourself. Because there's people in this world that can't eat, period. At all. And you have the, the luxury of going to that fridge and eating whatever it is you want to eat. And there are times you even have food to eat and you say, I don't want it. There's nothing to eat. Right? There's arrogance in that. That's not very humble. Is fasting also a test? Absolutely, it's a test. Maybe that was Testing your dependence on God. Yeah. I mean, when you fast and I'm laying in bed fasting and I have every every ability to go up in the middle of the night, go downstairs, go to the fridge and eat. But I'm giving my dependence, my 
life to God to say, look it, I am doing this and I need your help. I cannot do this without you. I do not have the willpower whatsoever. I'm strong in a lot of different ways, but in the ways of, of eating and holding back and wanting to eat, watching you guys eat, watching people eat at work or wherever, that is a test. How strong is my faith? I can only take it so far, but he's the one that's gonna help me take it to beyond. Is it cause like, am I fasting right now since I'm not eating? Is that considered fasting? Right no, is, uh, if, if you're just not eating at any point in the day, is that fasting? No, it's not fasting. Fasting is, okay. is the, the, yeah, you're consciously making that effort of not to eat because you know it's gonna put a burden on your body, but you're giving that burden to God. Go ahead. When we pray before we eat, is that fasting because we want to eat then, but we have to pray before eating? As praying before eating, is that fasting? No, it's not. Um, praying before eating, to me, is the, the symbology of of this is my body eat this is my blood and drink right when Christ says that in the last supper we give him glory praise and thanks to the fact that we can eat and it's because of him that we do and as we eat we're consuming him as our life he is our bread he is our which fulfilling our body, our soul, our heart, our mind. He is the sustenance that we need to survive in this world. So when we eat, we're looking to him as that's the glory. We, we, we look at him and say, thank you for this food. Thank you for allowing us to eat it in comfort. Because there's people in this world, you're very lucky, very lucky to live in a world, in a country right in a particular area in this country that you can eat whenever you want. There's many people that don't even have a place to live. And if you don't have a place to live, how are you gonna have a place to store any food? So you humble yourself. It's a sense of humility at the table saying, thank you, Father. Thank you for allowing us to eat. Even though you live in a place where you can have it in abundance, we still say thank you because he is allowing it. Anybody else? Can you fast with anything else or is it just food and water? Um, you can fast with anything else, but the what we just went over was just food and water. Fasting is just abstaining, but fasting and, and the terminology fasting is specific, specific for food and water. I was saying, like, in the Bible, it says, fast for God. Could I say, the term that's related to food, but... Well, food and fasting is food. So if you're not going to, if you're going to abstain from doing something other than food, that would be repentance of doing the wickedness and not turning back to it. Right? You want to abstain from doing a wicked act. And hopefully, if you're an infant in your journey to Christ, then as you go on and on and on, the absence from your abstaining from doing something wicked gets better and better, stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning journey of praying and fasting, your fasting will be tough. But as you keep doing it over and over and over and over, it gets stronger and stronger within you because your journey, your walk with God gets stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. So it becomes easier. Thank you very much. Until next time, Godspeed.